Our today's discussion is focused on the two latest books by Professor Nayef al Rodan, whom I will introduce to you in a minute. My name is Alexandra Matas. I am the senior advisor and uh, the deputy head of the diplomatic dialogue at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. Uh, and I will be moderating the discussion today. So a few words first about our center. We are an impartial, independent and inclusive international foundation based in Geneva, Switzerland. Our mission is to promote peace and international security and to prepare and transform individuals and organizations so they can create a safer world. And we do this on uh, several parallel tracks uh, through executive education by providing platform for track 1.5 and track 2 dialogues and through policy advice. So today we will uh, discuss two fascinating books that, that I have here with me, uh, entitled Emotional Immoral Egoism, A Neurophilosophy of Human Nature and Motivations, and On Power, Neurophilosophical Foundations and Policy Implications. The author of this book, Professor Nayef Adaradan, who is uh, the head of the Geopolitics and Global Futures Program uh, at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. He is a neuroscientist, philosopher, and geostrategist. He is an honorary fellow at St. Anthony's College of University of Oxford and a senior research fellow at the Institute of Philosophy at the Institute of London. Through many innovative books and articles, Professor Adradan has made significant conceptual contributions to the application of the field of neurophilosophy to human nature, contemporary geopolitics, international relations, and outer space security. We are, we are very honored, uh, Professor Adradan, to have you uh, here with us today. Uh, and I will invite you to present your books in a few moments after the introductory uh, remarks. We have uh, gathered an excellent panel of speakers for this uh, discussion about the books, and I will introduce them in uh, the order of their presentations. Uh, first, Ambassador Thomas Gravenger, uh, who will provide us with introductory remarks. Ambassador Gravenger is the director of the Geneva Center for Security Policy. He has uh, enjoyed a distinguished career as a Swiss diplomat at the Swiss Federal Department of Foreign Affairs. For instance, he served as Deputy Director General of the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, the SDC. Uh, he was also permanent representative of Switzerland to the organization Security Cooperation Europe in Vienna. And most recently, from 2017 to 2020, he served as the Secretary General of the OEC. Mr. Nicholas Snigli uh, will present to us the book on human nature and motivations. He is the former chairman of the World Trade Organization Government Procurement Agreement and Swiss senior negotiator. Nicholas has also been lecturing on uh, issues including uh, complex negotiation dynamics, leadership, intellectual, uh, intercultural communication. Uh, at the Executive Master's Program uh, here at the Graduate Institute in Geneva. So uh, I believe given your experience, uh, Nicolas, you have a lot to share with us on human nature and uh, motivations. And last but not least, Dr. Paul Vallet, the GCSP Associate Fellow, who will discuss the second book on power. Uh, Dr. Vallet taught at Sciences Po and at the Institut National des Langues et Civilisations Orientales in Paris. Uh, he was a visiting assistant professor at the Fletcher School and University of Mainz. He has published extensively and regularly appears on international television news channels. So before giving the floor to uh, Ambassador Greminger for his opening remarks, just a few ho uh, housekeeping rules. Uh, this is a public event and it will be recorded and made available on YouTube. So after the panelists finish their presentations, we will start taking your questions. I remind you that you can ask your questions in the Q&A box, which is on the bottom of your screen. 
So on this, I wish us a very fruitful discussion today. And without further ado, I give you the floor, Thomas. Thank you very much, uh, Sasha, uh, Professor Alrodan, DNIF. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues, good afternoon. I would like to uh, welcome you very warmly to our webinar. This will be an extraordinary afternoon. Um, because we will be exploring human nature, power, and policy, and their interplay. And I'm very proud uh, that we can do this exploration together this afternoon on the occasion of the recent release of these two uh, brilliant books um, on these topics by uh, Professor uh, Naif al Rodan, head of GCSP's Geopolitics and Global Futures uh, uh, program. Obviously, uh, these books represent important, uh, the synthesis of uh, very important research on the matter. Now, why is it so important to better understand human nature and power? In today's globalized and fast moving world, the meaning of power has changed and the patterns of influence are continuously evolving. The importance of power has never been more evident uh, than these days. Equally important is human nature, which has universal security implications that do require scrutiny and reflection. A thorough understanding of human nature and power can help guide the policy building process for better governance and ultimately for more peace and security in this world. Now, let me say a few uh, words uh, about the author, in addition to what you have already heard uh, by uh, our moderator, um, uh, Naif al uh, was educated at the most prestigious places you can imagine, uh, at Mayo Clinic, Yale University, and Harvard University. And yes, he began his career as neurosurgeon and neuroscientist. And then in, 20, uh, uh, in, in 2002, 20 years ago, uh, Naev shifted his scholarly focus to the interplay between neuroscience and international relations. And through several publications, he pioneered the application of neuroscience and namely the neurochemical mechanisms that underpin emotions to the understanding of trends uh, in contemporary geopolitics and global security. In 2006, uh, that makes it 15 years ago, uh, Naev joined the Geneva Center for Security Policy as head of the Geopolitics and Global Futures Program. And as uh, Sasha has uh, uh, mentioned, he's an honorary fellow of St. Anthony's. Uh, he's a senior research fellow at the Institute of Philosophy of the University of London. And uh, he's an active member of the Frontier Risks Global Agenda Council at the WEF, at the World Economic Forum. And he was voted one of the top 30 most influential living neuroscientists and one of the uh, top 100 geo strategists in the world. He has published uh, a total of 25 books and 250 articles proposing many innovative concepts and theories in politics, security, philosophy, and history. Naev's two last books definitely open new avenues of reflection on power, human nature, and policy. And I, will, I, I do hope that you will enjoy reading them as much as uh, I did. And thank you for your attention. And now uh, I would like to turn the floor over to you, uh, Naev. Uh, you will say a few words, and I wish you uh, an enjoyable and, I'm sure, enlightening webinar.
Thank you very much, uh, Thomas. Thank you, Sasha. Um, I'm honored to be here. I'm privileged for, for the effort uh, made by the Institute and by our two distinguished uh, commentators. I won't steal their thunder, but I will say just a few words uh, and very briefly about the two books. Um, I'll start, uh, so just to start with the idea that all political theorists throughout human history have always started with a specific view of human nature. That's from Aristotle all the way down to um, Machiavelli, Hobbes, Locke, until the present day. And my view of human nature is uh, a little different in that it's transdisciplinary. So it mixes neuroscience, which is an innovation in looking at human nature, philosophy, history, um, international relations, strategic culture, which we, if we have time, I'll go back to, which is very relevant to international politics, disruptive technologies, especially machine learning and AI, um, conf conflict studies, cultural studies. And in its, by its nature, it's transdisciplinary. Well, I always make the, the, the caveat that it's not deterministic nor reductionist. So I don't say neuroscientific evidence says this, therefore we're all like this. This is, this is a typical conceptual enterprise where the central thesis about human nature is it's malleable, but it's also fragile. It is really important to remember those two because those two have huge implications. The malleability gives us hope. The fragility gives us concern. Because there, if, when we're stressed as a species or as individuals or as groups, we don't do very well. Um, we go off uh, the rails, as it were. Um, so my view uh, of human nature advocates, I mean, it, it is an objective, um, pragmatic explanation of what we know about the neuroscientific underpinnings of our human faculties. Um, and it advocates at the end, I'll start with the end, um, multi-sum rather than zero-sum approaches. It advocates win-win solutions. It advocates symbiotic inclusive policies, not because these sound good or wonderful. It's because given what you, you will hear about my view of human nature, as well as from our two distinguished colleagues, these are a must. There's no other way to do it going forward. It's not because they're the the honorable, um, wonderful things to do. So we, my central thesis is that we are emotional, amoral egoists. Um, and that, that may sound pessimistic, it may sound uh, like a, a negative view of humanity, but it's not. It's actually very pragmatic. And it depends, and there's a Gaussian curve for the way I look at it. And our moral compass, which I'll come back to in a minute, can actually shift according to societal and institutional frameworks. So we shouldn't really give up too quickly. So we're emotional. What, what does that mean? It means we are far more emotional than rational. Uh, that, that may come as a surprise to some. Um, and it turns out that the most rational of decisions that we make has a huge emotional component. And there have been some studies, um, neurological studies dating back to the 80s, that when there's a lesion, and the emotional processing cortex, we don't make rational decisions anymore. I mean, that sounds counterintuitive, but, it, but it's true. We are also amoral. Now, that I said that most of us, most of the time. Doesn't mean we're not capable of moral behavior. But we're also capable of immoral behavior. And the nicest and the most grounded and elegant of us is capable of both, given the circumstances. Um, and the egoism, of course, is, is, is self-interest. So um, our moral compass is actually governed specifically by what I call perceived emotional self-interest. And the prefix of perceived is absolutely critical because you can perceive incorrectly and sabotage the very, national, uh, the very human interest you think you want to accomplish. So it's perceived emotional self-interest. That's really important uh, to remember. And when we're stressed, when we're alienated, when we're under pressure, uh, then we shift to, to the wrong side of the curve. All of us are capable of doing that. Uh, um, um, I've also taken that uh, up to a different level where I have talked about the emotionality of the state. 
So as you know, international relations theory presupposes the rationality of the state. In other words, the state will do things that are in the national interest of that state. And for the most part, that is true, but it's not always true. Uh, states overreach, they, do, they do act emotionally um, quite often in human history. Um, and why? Because institutions of even accountable, transparent governance entities are made up of people who have backgrounds, who have aspirations, who have concerns. Who, what were they taught at school? Uh, is there a skewed view of their own history? Is there a skewed view of someone else's history, which is more dangerous? So they, you know, people, people don't come as a tabula rasa, as John Locke uh, said. We, we come um, actually endowed with biological survival mechanisms and through our societal mechanisms, we are, we, things are piled up upon us. By the time we're adults, we have actually a skewed view of, of the world uh, based on how we existed. Um, and, and of course, these have huge implications um, for all kinds of things, governance, societal structure, societal cohesion, societal friction on the other side, um, managing disruptive technologies that are threatening our uh, autonomy, that are threatening our identity and meritocracy, um, uh, and to achieve primarily sustainable peace and security, where cultural discourse, conflict discourse, uh, individual difference are taken into account. Uh, now, that's, that's the foundational, I'm, I'm, I have to be brief because in the interest of time. So I took that um, understanding and I applied it to a number of things over the last uh, 15 years, power, history, statecraft, international relations, disruptive technologies. But for uh, today's discussion, I will focus on power just for two or three minutes. So. So I look at power, again, from a neuro-philosophical angle um, and from a historical, contemporary, predictive, analytic approach um, and the implications of power. And when I talk about power, I don't, as, as the book uh, goes into great detail, I, I don't focus specifically on political power, although that's important. Power is if you're running a local restaurant or running a local uh, coffee shop or running a sports team or corporate governance, the same principles apply. Um, it, it, there's no difference whatsoever. Um, and why is that relevant? Because it's highly relevant to governance, to ethics, to politics, to moral philosophy, to public policy, to accountable governance, to transparent governance. And uh, as said before, to sustainable peace and security, both domestically and elsewhere. The central idea of the book started with an, with an article that I published in 2015 in the Oxford University uh, blog. And then um, it received so much attention that I thought it warranted a book. And the central idea of that article, and that's the book, is that power is highly addictive. And it is part of my neuro P5, which is the five motivations of man, which is power, pride, power, profit, pleasure, pride, and permanency. And what I mean by permanency is not longevity, although that's part of it, but it also includes legacy. So that you do things that transcend your physical existence. So power to me is number one. And there's a reason for that. Because from an evolutionary psychology standpoint, and from actually a neurobiological development standpoint, human beings and all biological entities actually, but because we're conscious beings, we associate power with survival. So it is it actually power taps into a ready-made reward center. Uh, and that reward center is a diffuse, set of neuronal architecture in the brain that is based on the, what we call the mesolimbic system, but gets feedback from the hypothalamus, the thalamus, the striatum, and critically from the central amygdala, which is where fear is processed. And central to this reward center is the release of dopamine, uh, which is a motivational uh, neurochemical. And in the, in the nucleus accumbens is where serotonin is released, which is very central to this. So it's really 
pleasure and reward are linked together. And power taps into that very, um, very heavily. Um, uh, so it's addictive. What does that mean, addictive? It means if we lose it, we actually crave it. We cannot, like any addictive process, whether it's caffeine or something more serious or gambling or heavy drugs, we don't do very well when power gets away from us. Again, not political power per se. Uh, if, you, if you're head of a section or if you're head of, uh, as, as I said, of uh, supermarket section selling something. If, if somebody tells you you can't do that anymore, that's devastating. And it's actually not a behavioral devastation, but a, a neurochemical one. This is where people, I think the central um, message is that this is beyond comprehension. It is beyond um, conscious decision. It's a cellular event that actually in, is intertwined with psychological event and feedback from the environment. But it's much more serious, just like when someone has an addictive process, you can't say stop it, cold turkey. It's, it doesn't work. Same, same thing applies here. It needs, you need, at the receptor level, what we call neuroscience, you need to deregulate. So you need, you, those cells need to not crave those neurochemicals as much, and that, then you give it up. But it's a heavy, difficult process. Um, and history is full of examples where people in corporate government or in political power um, had the, uh, the, the possibility to leave their position, but actually they would rather die than do so. Mm. And they do die. It's because they cannot imagine a life, not being the CEO of this, without having that kind of thrill. And it's an ultimate, it's actually in neurochemical terms, it's called the ultimate high. It's, the, it's unrivaled uh, in terms of the feel. So no human being is able to resist that. So uh, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, so this is not, um, um, so it's a cellular, first and foremost, resulting in a neurochemical, resulting in a behavioral output. And, the, and, and then the loop, right? whether it's a positive feed loop or a negative feed loop. Um, of course, that's relevant to all kinds of things, relevance to governance, and relevant to corporate accountability, to integrity, to um, societal norms, uh, to make sure everybody has a say, everybody's happy. Um, and as we venture into transhumanistic approaches, which I've written about a great deal, which is the ability to change ourselves, both technologically and biologically, um, this even becomes even more because chances are uh, we, we will have the possibility within a couple of decades of uh, making ourselves smarter uh, with more power physically and cognitively, less emotional, more emotional. This is in the book because we know and we will know more about the substrate, the, the neurochemical and neuroscientific substrates of all of these things. And therefore, it's... It is really, and that's why I've written so much on AI and, and emerging technology governance, because we will be in trouble if we don't set some enforceable norms, not, not just some nice ideas that we throw. I think I, I, I will stop here uh, so that I don't infringe upon our colleagues' time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nayef, for throwing in already this fascinating ideas and giving us appetite for, 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 for the discussion. I have taken uh, already some, some notes uh, about the, the human nature, uh, that we are all emotional, not so rational, uh, we are all immoral, but in, depending also on the situation and in which um, societal structure we can find ourselves, this a very interesting notion of perceived emotional uh, self-interest, which is driving us. Uh, uh, so that I, I would maybe stop also here on those ideas for the first book and give the floor to Nicholas, and then we will move to Paul to discuss on the power. So, uh, Mr. Nickley, the floor is yours, please. Thank you so much, Alexandra, for giving me the floor and, and, and warm thanks to the GCSP and to Professor Al Rodan Nayef for uh, inviting me uh, to introduce this. Uh, magnificent book, Emotional, Amoral, Egoism. As you can see in my book, there are tons of little notes here. <laughs> it, is, it is exceptional. It's both a, a pleasure and an honor to modestly contribute to this launch. 
But before I, I get into the book, uh, I, I, I feel I, I need to state the obvious. Uh, the views I express here are entirely mine. So they, they don't, they cannot be attributed to the, the institutions I served or I uh, do serve. Uh, this being said, let's get into the, the, the crux of it. And I'll start this journey uh, with uh, René Descartes, the French philosopher. René Descartes once wrote that reading of all good books is like a conversation with the finest minds of past centuries. I'm sorry to say, and I'll be very provocative here, this is only half true. Indeed, reading Professor Al Rodan's books is in it like a conversation with one of the finest minds of this <laughs> century. To say that Emotional Amoral Egoism is an ambitious book uh, is a massive understatement. It's what I would call a tour de force, which shakes the reader in the best sense of the term. Humanity and our planetary ecosystem are indeed both a crossroad. And we are faced with a series of challenges which I would qualify as being truly Shakespearean. For many uh, living creatures, humanity, but also other living creatures, it really is to be or not to be. And at the time where we need to reinvent the social contract between humans, but also between humans and machine, Nayef, you spoke about the, the importance of the evolution of technology. And the third element here is the, the social contract between humanity and nature. Uh, we uh, understanding a more holistic understanding of what makes us who we are and uh, the very practical consequences of this understanding is truly essential. From that standpoint, this book could not be more timely. To give ourselves a thought at preserving peace, security and prosperity, and to turn crisis into opportunity, we need to apply new lenses to existential challenges we are facing. And to do that, we need to leave disciplinary boundaries behind. Uh, because as human nature is too complex a phenomenon, it cannot be adequately comprehended through single disciplinary approaches. So building bridges between disciplines, but also between stakeholders is the new normal, it has to be. And by calling neuroscience, sociology, political science, philosophy, history, and geostrategy to the table, Professor Al Rodan, dear Nayef, you unquestionably take the reader uh, on, a verti on a vertiginous intellectual voyage, which in my opinion, and I have had the privilege of having discussions with you over, over the years, which really reflects your own polymatic journey. And that's truly an honor. Could one think about a better publicity for deep interdisciplinary research and implementation suggestions than this book, Emotional Amoral Egoism? In fact, I don't know, because I'm not a marketing guy. But to me, integrating neuroscientific insights, the latest of them, into essential questions usually dealt with rather classically by scholars and practitioners of policymaking and international relations offers immense value added as it significantly widens the scope of our understanding. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends and Dear colleagues, some books should be tasted, some devoured, but only a few should be chewed and digested thoroughly. 
I can certainly concur with that fine piece of advice from Sir Francis Bacon, one of Renaissance's finest scientists and philosopher. Whether you read this book chapter by chapter, or you choose bits and pieces, you will find an enormous amount to chew and to digest. There is so much food for thought in uh, this uh, book. And first, I have obviously gone through the whole book from one part to the next. Having started my academic career with uh, studying economic history, economic and social history, uh, before then moving into policy making and international relations, the order of the chapters and the flow of the book suited me very well. But then in the second stage, I have reconsulted a few uh, parts I found particularly relevant as a follow up, a bit like uh, my, my inner child would, would play with, with innovative pieces of Lego. Uh, and, and so I have really to say both approaches sort of like going one to, to, through the book in a classical way or like just getting into pieces uh, one after the other in, in, a, in a more free freestyle kind of mode uh, worked very well. And I think that has, attests once again to the excellent quality and the overall balance of uh, the architecture of Professor Al Rodan's book. I personally found the substantive chapter dedicated to the historical overview of approaches to human nature very, very useful. This is where the book really starts. Uh, I found it useful because it, it gives the, the, the reader a condensed but very complete panorama of the extraordinary diversity uh, of thought on human nature across both geography and history. In this context, I absolutely loved uh, the inclusion of leading thinkers from the Middle East and Asia, something I, I usually don't, do not see enough, and something which, in my opinion, is essentially in a world where we need to find solutions which are obviously multipolar. The central chapter, to go in, in the order of the book, the central chapter centered on emotional amoral egoism as a theory of human motivation, focusing on the famous neuro P5, Dr. Uh, Dr. Al Rodan mentioned before, power, profit, pleasure, pride and permanency. This chapter clearly lives up to the hype as it significantly builds up on uh, the research done uh, by, Na by Nayef for the first edition of Emotional Amoral Egoism. And I think the first edition came out in 2008, right? So the first in 2008, the second in 2021. And given the fact that we are now uh, moving, uh, as we are moving uh, into exponential uh, development of technology, perhaps the third edition of the book should come in, come in somewhat among, uh, so somewhere in the mid 2020s. Uh, that, that's, 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 that's what I sort of foresee. <laughs> um, so so that, that in this context, and as, as somebody who has been deeply involved in policymaking over the last 20 odd years, I, I found the reflection on how far reaching consequences human announcement uh, has, I found this particularly uh, pertinent. As for the last two parts of the book, the security implication of uh, the theory of emotional amoral egoism and the way forward to unlocking uh, the best in human nature, they brilliantly focus on the necessity to build dignity-based governance. The capacity of states to overcome the sterile and destructive zero-sum game tendencies and to move towards multi-sum win-wins is particularly crucial in this context, as highlighted by Professor Al Rodan towards the end, the end of part four of the book. And, and you just made that point once again in your introduction. And then we come to the policy recommendations and in the final part of the book, and they are to me uh, the proverbial cherry on the cake. Balancing emotionality with reason, security and human rights, 
countering amorality with accountability, transparency and justice, channeling egoism through opportunity, inclusiveness and innovation, this seems to be the roadmap to keep the more somber side of human uh, nature at bay and bring the best out of humanity. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, President Harry Truman famously reminded that not all readers are leaders, but all leaders are readers. The problem we need, therefore, to overcome in this context is that, in my opinion at least, far too few leaders do possess a precise and pragmatic neuroscience-enhanced knowledge of human nature. If I turn to my younger self, as an elected chairperson of several uh, global governance negotiation and mediation processes between 2005 and 2013, I'm not afraid to admit that I would have benefited enormously from a much more structured understanding of what funda fundamentally drives us, the famous Euro P5. I would unquestionably have avoided a few mistakes and been a better ser servant to all those states and people who entrusted me. Leaders usually are more logically highlighting the benefits of the accords they are reaching. Uh, but, how, but for each and every process which is successfully concluded, how many, how many uh, uh, do fail? Worse, how many could have succeeded if those involved would have had a better understanding of the universal drivers of humanity? To lower the missed opportunity costs and the suffering attached to the failure of taking into account the critical needs of human dignity developed in Professor Al Roden's book, I feel we need to better equip all those who are leading and taking part in multilateral, plurilateral, bilateral, and multi stakeholder efforts to make our world a more secure, peaceful, inclusive and substantive, sustainable place. This is why I feel emotional, amoral egoism, uh, the content of this very book here, should be at the top of the reading list for leaders at every level of government, uh, but also in business and civil society. However, I think we should not stop there. Think about the opportunity of high school and college students familiarizing with the Neuro P5. Overall, we would clearly be better off if there would be a broader individual and collective understanding of the fundamental drivers of human nature, wouldn't we? Professor Al Rodan, dear Nayef, I feel your books, or at least more easily chewable and digestible bits and pieces of them, to borrow Sir Francis's terms, could ideally be part of the, of the enhanced education curricula that this fast changing world so desperately needs. Is that making sense to you as well? And if yes, what is your plan to get us there? In addition, how can we help? So this is my challenge to you. Dear friends, I'd like to conclude with one observation which I find fundamental in Professor Al Rodan's book. While our emotional amoral egoism and humanity's five most powerful motivators are likely to remain with us over the long term, we seem far from being entirely determined by our neurochemistry. That in my opinion, is a piece of very good news in a world that really needs it at the moment. Some readers might find this book slightly pessimistic, but as uh, Professor Al Roden uh, just said in his introduction, and I concur with him, I, I'd rather qualify this as uh, the, the, the conclusions of, of, of this uh, research as cautiously optimistic. 
as there is indeed a narrow corridor which allows us to build a prosperous, inclusive, and sustainable, dignity-based world. It's therefore upon us to work together and to build the right sort of resilient institutions with privil which privileges the requirements of human dignity. That insistence on the fundamental importance of institutions echoes and brilliantly complements, in my opinion, the, the scholarly work done by Daron Asemoglu and James Robinson, who have researched and written extensively on uh, this very topic, the importance, the fundamental importance of institutions. That, in, that work, the work to build institutions, is likely always going to remain a work in progress. We will never uh, be there, especially with enhanced technology likely to play such a, a transformative role in the years and decades to come. Even if we do great, it's going to remain work in progress, uh, in other terms, as there is no room for complacency, particularly in a world which is transformed exponentially by technological forces. In this context, Professor Al Roden's powerful call for the development of a multidisciplinary and multi-stakeholder regulation effort and capacity to generate safety standards for emerging technologies does obviously resonate very strongly with me, as it will uh, with many other readers for sure. Ben Okri, the formidable Nigerian poet and novelist, once wrote that reading is an act of civilization. It's one of the greatest acts of civilization because it takes the raw material of the mind and builds castles of possibilities. Dear Professor Al Roden, dear Nayef, with emotional and moral egoism, you have shed a brilliant light on the importance of human nature, which is indispensable if we want to understand the world in which we live. This leaves us all better equipped for the formidable task at hand, building a dignity-based castle of possibilities for a thriving humanity and a regenerated world. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nicolas, for this very straightforward contribution. You really presented not only the ideas and discussed the ideas uh, from the book, you also spoke to us about the methodology, the structure. Um, uh, you also told us basically who is the target audience for this book, which is a very range, uh, a very uh, large uh, range of people starting from students of universities and going up to uh, business community and leaders. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for that. If you don't mind, I will keep your question uh, for Professor Al-Radan for, for the uh, Q&A uh, session. I'm also very interested basically uh, how this, uh, these books could be included in the academic uh, curriculum. And I think after your presentations, our audience who have not yet read the books, the book, uh, the first one book at least, are uh, very motivated to do so. And now I would like to turn to uh, Dr. Vallet for uh, his comments on the second book on power, Paul, please, of course. Yes. Thank you very much, Alexandra, um, Ambassador, um, Professor Rodan, uh, Nicholas. Uh, of course, I too am very grateful to the uh, GCSP for organizing this uh, uh, really fascinating uh, discussion on uh, this kind of uh, work, which I, I feel uh, in my uh, few years now at the, at the GCSP, uh, this is the kind of work that really does, I think, reflect the sort of work and reflection that goes on in such a center and uh, which has made it, uh, uh, for me, uh, in particular, a, uh, a very pleasant place to, uh, to attend uh, after, as uh, Sasha was kind of mentioned a, a prior academic career. So uh, uh, this gives you a lot of hope, uh, especially uh, if I can engage in all the friendly uh, Cambridge versus Oxford banter. Uh, but it actually it does go, go to show that you know, the, uh, the road to uh, knowledge and to understanding, uh, as has been highlighted, I think, in both Nicholas's presentation, and I think you'll feel it from mine in, on, about the book on power, uh, 
this real call for transdisciplinary understanding is uh, something that I have rarely seen as well illustrated as when I was uh, given the opportunity to, to read this book, which I'll, I'll present to you. Um, now on power, uh, of course, is, is also sort of an interesting, um, uh, an interesting work um, in part because uh, I also don't think uh, I've uh, often had the occasion in my career uh, to be presented really um, with the uh, sort of book form of a twin birth because uh, uh, it, it has to be said that the, the both the volumes uh, are complementary and they, they do touch on the same subject, uh, though perhaps uh, there is a, uh, uh, a uh, more stringent focus on the introduction of the theory of emotional and moral uh, egotism, uh, which uh, Nicholas has just presented. Uh, and, and, and this book, in, in some ways, retakes this theory uh, and uh, perhaps applies it more concretely to the question of its title, which is, uh, which is on power. Um, and uh, of course, uh, to uh, me with the training as a historian and a uh, political scientist, uh, I found uh, some of the uh, tracks of this book, and especially I'll be talking a bit more uh, about uh, its uh, structure and how it's been divided, but uh, uh, some parts have uh, been uh, very familiar and also, of course, very enlightening because of the, the new perspective that the author was bringing uh, to analyzing these, these questions of, of being part of the subjects that I've studied and taught. Um, and then moving on to, of course, the, the second part, uh, which uh, turned to uh, some of these very uh, critical uh, issues for our time and for the future, uh, which you uh, dealt about, which at first I thought might be a little bit intimidating for uh, someone uh, from outside the box, in, in, or at least outside the newer neuroscientific discipline. But uh, in the end, my experience as a reader was not one of, of intimidation, but rather one, uh, I think, as Nicholas has experienced, of, uh, of discovery and then of uh, perhaps uh, enlightenment in, uh, if, in respect to questions that we hadn't understood yet. So uh, I think uh, this has been my, my primary experience as a reader, and it's opened a lot of uh, questions, which I hope we'll, we'll be feeling at the author in, in our discussion uh, later on. Uh, now, I thought uh, it might be interesting since, of course, this is a book that delves uh, on power and it might, uh, to some of our viewers, uh, be a little bit, uh, uh, be a little bit uh, uh, difficult when you haven't read the books yet to figure out what is this perspective that you are coming to, especially, of course, one that is going to be uh, uh, surprising to many about the notion of a neurosurgeon and neuroscientist suddenly delving on questions that we will see a lot of political philosophers, political practitioners across the ages and geography, as uh, Nicholas understood. Uh, so, so I thought it might be uh, good, of course, for our viewers to uh, see how exactly you are uh, defining power at the start of uh, your work to explain to us exactly what it is you are aiming for. So you define power as the ability to exercise influence positively or negatively, in order to achieve specific endpoints that satisfy primordial and perceived psychological predilections and provide in it neurochemical gratification. Now, of course, this sounds like a very different uh, definition of uh, that that would be uh, uh, proposed by a different kind of author. You mentioned Aristotle in your uh, introduction, so many of the, his uh, followers uh, in the works of uh, political theory across the ages uh, will have taken uh, a somewhat uh, different, uh, perhaps different take. But the fact that you do mention this notion of gratification uh, and coming at it from a neuroscientific understanding uh, is something that I think is primordial for us to understand what you're trying to um, what you're trying to show. Uh, now, of course, it's through the study of this that you've derived uh, this theory about uh, emotional and moral uh, egoism, the application of neuroscientific insights to the analysis of the concept of power 
and in the field of international relations, because we are the GCSP after all, uh, and we managed to do that uh, that quite uh, quite well. Um, if I may, then of course uh, move uh, towards a description of uh, the structure of your book, which again, as Nicholas mentioned, for uh, the other work. Uh, is I think a great forte of this book in particular, which makes it uh, very approachable for a large public. Um, uh, it is rather very easily for the reader derived in two main parts. And uh, as I mentioned, the first part uh, is mainly historical. So the first three chapters uh, in a way take us through a real sweep of human history and the human experience of uh, the exercise of power, the definition of power. You offer uh, numerous uh, examples that will go from oldest antiquity uh, to the birth of the modern age is at the close, uh, which, with which you close the, uh, uh, the first chapter. Uh, our second chapter deals very specifically with the 20th century. Uh, so of course, there's a lot of experiences uh, there uh, to look uh, as well in a large part, of course, because the 20th century is the uh, first phase in history in which the process that you described really accelerates to a great deal. Uh, the explosion of the technological uh, in, uh, technological innovation. Uh, it's the century in which the nature of power, according to you, is most heavily contested. And I think that's uh, uh, probably a, a good assessment uh, in this matter. It's, of course, the century of the two great world wars, of totalitarianism, uh, of uh, alliances, nationalisms, uh, of course, with the advent of uh, weapons of mass destruction, also, of course, the first time that the existential question is raised because of human behavior uh, in this respect. It's, of course, uh, been the century of the Cold War, it's been the century of decolonization, and, uh, of course, uh, also uh, uh, the century in which, uh, I think very interestingly, and, and this is also something that will, that makes your work also so approachable to the general public, probably the century in which uh, you also have uh, the explosion thanks to mass entertainment, mass literature, and you make a really great use of popular literature and film and entertainment uh, to point out uh, how uh, many of the dystopian works uh, that were produced in this period really offer us some of the first insights in which you are then going to, I think, develop where our humanity might be uh, uh, might be heading, um, and of course, your uh, third chapter is the one that opens our young twenty first century uh, and puts us into the picture of where we are exactly uh, at this moment. It's a very up to date uh, reflection on not just the technological advances, but also, of course, the uh, uh, state of uh, uh, globalization, uh, where we are at, and how that affects, uh, of course the uh, big uh, rivalry. But uh, very interestingly, of course, uh, by the time we reach this 21st century, uh, you put us uh, into a uh, uh, situation uh, where uh, basically, uh, if we'll see from the uh, quotes on the, the next slides, uh, that uh, we uh, begin to see how uh, many of the uh, questions of the uh, concept of power remain completely uh, open uh, questions. And uh, of course, when you say the concept of power can be analyzed in terms of behavior and intention, material capacities, capabilities, sorry, uh, purpose delegation and comparison with others, uh, we are indeed in a judgment where you understand really that you're not just talking about, of course, our current world, but it, these are questions that indeed stem from the human experience that you described in the past uh, chapters uh, as well, too. And of course, you also raise a lot of uh, other contemporary questions that we've been raising uh, about power, uh, especially, of course, in the uh, post-Cold War era and the attempt uh, to uh, build a new international order since, of course, you've all also, of course, argued uh, the uh, fact, uh, if I quote on the, uh, uh, on the uh, next slides, uh, that um, uh, in the globalization concept, the concept of power does not emanate from a form of government, but rather from governance. This is really at the heart 
of our contemporary uh, interrogations uh, on a multiple number of uh, issues uh, of current international relations. And the next quote, our protection still matters, uh, but it has evolved to include other elements than those of national power. Uh, and of course, greater variety of uh, seven state capacities to uh, master. Now, that, of course, this is, a, uh, I think, uh, some uh, uh, contemporary uh, interrogations uh, that, uh, well, uh, Nicholas will have had more practical experience than uh, myself uh, as a practitioner. Uh, but uh, this, too, I think, is a, a very uh, original uh, way to look at things. Uh, we'll show later on, of course, also some of the uh, uh, very uh, useful graphs that you've added to the uh, work that uh, give us a little bit more understanding uh, of this uh, as well, too. And finally, of course, you also uh, ask a yes, seminal question. I think that's the last quote I had. Power is a reflection of inequalities, and inequalities feed off power. Here, too, I think. Uh, uh, anyone thinking about the uh, uh, current state of the world uh, is going to uh, relate uh, to that. So, as I said, uh, a first part of the uh, book that uh, speaks really well uh, to uh, people who are already familiar with the fields of political theory uh, and uh, history as well. But again, illustrated uh, in a way that is, uh, of course, extremely erudite, extremely wide ranging. Uh, which uh, makes it uh, a very agreeable lead for the intellectually curious. And I think at this stage, in particular, I would very much uh, second uh, the uh, point that Nicholas was making in his presentation, uh, that uh, you have this uh, uh, capacity to uh, explain so many of these stories and make such good use of these examples that, yes, we should definitely not consider that these are works that should be uh, conscribed to a uh, specialist or scholarly audience, but there are certainly, I think, uh, easy ways to indeed condense them, to make them accessible to a very wide public. And, and, and the notion that you know, high school students or college students uh, could be getting an introduction to uh, some of the points uh, that you're making in, in, in these books, uh, I think that is highly feasible and attainable. So there's, I think, a notion of hope uh, for us there. And I'll come, of course, to the uh, second part of the uh, book, which, as I said at first, uh, might have seemed more intimidating, at least to the likes of uh, me in this matter. And I was then surprised, as Nicholas was in his uh, uh, own reading experience, uh, at uh, how I managed, in the end, to get uh, the essence, and uh, thanks to, uh, again, your clever use of examples and the uh, use of a lot of references uh, as well, too, uh, one finally realizes that uh, some of these uh, questions are actually very basic and very, uh, in fact, very easy to, uh, to understand. So, of course, your next uh, chapters are dealing uh, respectively first, uh, and this is probably chapter four, the one that returns to the theme that you uh, uh, developed in, at greater lengths in uh, your first book. So that's the uh, the chapter on neuroscience and the understanding of power. And this is where uh, the uh, uh, notion of uh, your theory of emotional and moral uh, egotism uh, gets explained to. Uh, now, of course, to contrast that, uh, many of us who have actually studied the notion of uh, power in, in, in politics and history uh, are in perhaps a more familiar uh, with the uh, definitions of power that have been uh, that have been um, <clears throat> formulated towards the end of the 20th century and in particular we think about the works of Joe Nye uh, and uh, of course this is a, uh, one that has uh, uh, of course been refined over the uh, last 30 or so years in which uh, this uh, question has been uh, discussed uh, as well too so of course we, we understood uh, we went from this uh, opposition uh, that Nye had already formulated about, between hard uh, and soft power. Uh, more recently, we've started to understand that there is also uh, a possible combination of the two uh, that uh, comes to a smart power. And the, the latest, I think, uh, development of that and one on which you, you insist is can we move from, of course, this notion of not only power being smart, uh, but also reaching uh, this uh, notion of being just, of, you know, getting to a stage of credible, uh, sustainable leadership. 
Um, and as you've explained in your introduction, as Nicholas has also formulated as well too, uh, I think this is where we understand that the book uh, is indeed not just about uh, political power uh, or, or power in international relations. Uh, that is a question of power within societies, within our own individual lives. And of course, we've actually just gone through uh, uh, some periods uh, uh, of time uh, in which uh, the sanitary situation, you know, left us, you know, no matter our standing in life uh, or preparedness uh, to uh, this uh, particular uh, kind of episode that we have to go through, uh, really wondering, uh, where is my power? Uh, what it is, what is, is it, what is it for? Can I still use it? Um, so yes, these are uh, questions we'll see uh, as well. Your fifth chapter uh, then uh, I think uh, goes uh, into uh, an explanation uh, and this reflects I think uh, a lot of the uh, works and the uh, courses that you've taught here, the, the GCSP mm -hmm. uh, on the notion of uh, human enhancement. Um, but of course, we return here with another graph that again, you know, calls on our uh, particular knowledge of a uh, current international relations uh, theory. We, we all know, of course, the, uh, uh, of the opposition between, uh, between realism and uh, liberalism and idealism and constructivism. Uh, and you've coined here uh, a very, of course, neuroscientific uh, approach uh, to uh, this by coining the notion of symbiotic uh, realism. Uh, and in part, of course, built on this understanding uh, of, uh, of human nature and not just, of course, the actual facts uh, that are affecting uh, our society in this matter. So, of course, you go through, uh, I think, also uh, a, very, um, a very approachable definition and explanation to a lay public of what uh, is this notion of human enhancement going to correspond to uh, and of course, you show that, of course, a large driver uh, of this uh, is actually uh, based uh, in, uh, in very ordinary human behavior that we are all familiar with. Uh, why do we take uh, stimulant drinks at different times of the day? Uh, why do uh, we consume uh, certain foods, certain products as well, too? Of course, when we have a medical condition, what kind of medicines have we been uh, called to uh, uh, take as well? That is the first start of, uh, of enhancement, uh, uh, has been, of course, uh, our uh, attempts to cure ourselves or to improve uh, our, our health uh, in, in general. So, of course, this is, of course, a very wise way, I'd think, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to introduce the uh, uh, question, because where we might find, feel ourselves very intimidated and frightened by the whole notion of enhancement, you first make it understand, well, that, well, the, the enhancement that we're heading towards to uh, is, in very many ways, uh, a logical continuation of our uh, already uh, basic and familiar human practices. What makes a difference, as you didn't point out towards the end of the fifth chapter and into the sixth chapter, uh, is uh, this notion that uh, well, our technological uh, progress in, uh, well, at first the different medical sciences uh, has allowed us to develop uh, devices or, or medications. So, of course, you make a distinction between the invasive and the non-invasive uh, ones. Uh, we are more familiar with the non-invasive ones. We started that, I think, perhaps because they were the most approachable in ways. But, of course, now we do have the possibility through technological research uh, to uh, develop more sophisticated uh, aspects too, of course, well, uh, this was uh, something that occurred during uh, the uh, holiday when I was reading through this book, but we all heard that the premiere of uh, this uh, first transplantation uh, of, an, of an animal organ onto a human and the human actually surviving. Uh, I remember when I was growing up, uh, I uh, uh, heard about the news about the, the first artificial hearts that were implanted in the 1980s. And these were, of course, big time uh, news items at first. Uh, of course, the first person who received such an artificial heart uh, actually did not live 
all that long afterwards, but of course they had then become a very standard issues. And we're talking about something that's already going back 25 years. So let's imagine where we will be 25 years from now when we're talking about already some of us uh, or uh, people we know who use cochlear implants uh, and uh, how sophisticated and how transformative as a living experience that is uh, going to uh, become. Um, but to end uh, with that and to end with the questions that you open uh, on this matter, you point out uh, very rightly that this technological, this technological uh, transformation uh, creates a set of problems of its own. Uh, and this is where you've uh, studied uh, artificial intelligence, uh, autonomous systems and so on, uh, the development of super intelligent machines and each of them, of course, offers the prospect, uh, in part also because, uh, as you point out, the people who are devising these, uh, these technologies are subject to the same uh, neurological, neurochemical imp impulses in the search for power uh, and may, by doing so, introduce, I wouldn't call them flaws, but you can really say problems in the use of that technology. And towards the end of the book, you're trying to offer, I think, uh, offer a few uh, solutions uh, that go towards, uh, well, if we're facing an irreversible trend, how are we going to harness that trend and retain a certain amount of control uh, to it? And that will be, I think, uh, one of the uh, uh, one of the uh, questions I'll, I'll have for you in the uh, uh, discussion, because at the same time. You are so convincing about the notion of how irreversible all of this is. Well, then I wonder whether we were not, after all, be powerless after all. You say no, but uh, maybe we'll have to uh, discuss that a little bit further. So I'll close on that. But thank you for a really uh, thoroughly uh, engrossing reading experience. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Very insightful and very thorough analysis and, and presentation. Uh, you emphasize the transdisciplinary approach of the book. You, you of course, uh, followed the structure and described to us the structure of the book, which basically makes it approachable for the uh, general public. And once again, we, we come to this notion that uh, the target audience is very broad for both of these books. Um, and uh, we have discussed also uh, the links uh, of uh, power, which is central for our work here, uh, work in uh, international peace and security. And I would like also to ask a few questions on that later. But maybe now already, uh, I would like to invite uh, Professor Rodan to ask the two questions coming from uh, our presenters uh, today. And if I may, so on the uh, basically future looking into the future also with emergence of uh, new technologies uh, and the linkages of the book, of the findings of the book uh, for the academic community. But also I would add here maybe a question from the chat that I have, how to link the insights from the book and the research done with the policy community. Uh, and basically, how the, does the GCSP plan to contribute to the emergence of effective regulatory tools, especially uh, when we talk about insights from neuroscience, which is a quite a technical, uh, uh, technical uh, there. So maybe, uh, uh, Naev, if you would sure. first comment on those questions. I'll start with the, the last one you, you mentioned. Um, the idea, I mean, we here at GCSP, we've always done this. Everything we've done, we always end up with policy implications. And we've, we've diluted the neuroscientific data uh, while keeping it authentic to be palatable to the policymaker. So if you look at our uh, publication records with its book or the 200 plus articles, everything, we address everything from super intelligence to AI to, um, to conflict to space security. So the answer to the chat question is we, we, we're doing that. Uh, if somebody's interested, they can look through the publications. Uh, and it's, it's very succinct, it's very pragmatic. We don't dream here. I mean, we, we understand um, the limitations, but we're, we're also not um, 
too restrictive about our ambition to have a better world. So, but I think our understanding of who we are, um, as I said, in the, uh, our malleability, but our fragility, uh, 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 that interplay is very important. Uh, um, so in terms of the policy implications, neuroscience and IR and security, we've, we've done that for the last 15 years and it's all in print. And the institution to its credit has allowed us to do that in a very nice way, all the way from space to AI and everything in between. Um, the earlier question from um, uh, my good friend Nicola is, um, how do we get schools involved? Uh, how do we get, uh, and I think it, I think the policymakers, I mean, we've written, hopefully they've read some of our work. Uh, somebody has read some of it. Um, and, and this event today is one way to get people's attention. But um, I think civil society, uh, uh, enlightened citizens, as I call it, and, uh, and we need to start in school. I think high school, a watered down version of, of this conceptual work at high school, I think prior to high school is too soon. Um, at high school is good. Um, because uh, don't forget, I mean, this is a recipe for an enlightened life as an individual. It's, uh, it has bigger implications, but also the, the individual level, if you do good, if you do right, if, you, if you're aware of your, of your um, threatening vulnerabilities to power, to pleasure, to pride, uh, to permanency, if you're aware of that, you can build on it, upon it. Uh, those are all not negatives. Uh, I think they're tools. So you can use them the way you want. Going back to Paul's point about, um, uh, will we still be in control? I, I, uh, I think I've written that it's inevitable transhumanism is what I have published many times. And I, I still believe that. I think because of this neuro P5, these new technologies, whether they're neurobiological or technological, and most likely a combination thereof, will absolutely be irresistible. I mean, who would, just for a moment, who would resist more power? Who would resist more pride or pleasure or profit or permanency? No one. And, and we shouldn't um, focus on preventing that. We should focus on regulating it. Because I think transhumanism unless unregulated, will get away from us. And we will have a problem. And I think the likelihood of it getting away from us is higher than that we're in control. And I've said that many times. Why? Because then, you know, I've written at the WEF, uh, the World Economic Forum, what does biology do to us that, that where we are still human? At some point, we will not be human because we, have, we would have changed Depends on the definition of human in terms of neurobiological terms. Once we understand the neurochemistry underlying all human behavior, and we're heading there, emotions, um, motivations, intellect, IQ, we will, we will be able to change that. Think of it as um, a very exaggerated plastic surgery. This is how I think about it. Plastic surgery or wearing glasses, that's an enhancement. Um, this is a multitude higher than that. But, but you know, uh, normally, uh, if I put on my former hat uh, in, in the medical field, if you go to a, a plastic surgeon too many times, he will ask that the psychiatrist sees you first because he thinks you're overdoing it. And that the problem isn't how, what you see in the mirror, but maybe something more profound uh, about your view of yourself. Transhumanism is actually similar in, in the sense that there's no limit and it will be abused. Actually, in, in not so open source material, it's actually in the military realm today, a lot of it. Um, but in the civilian term, we're heading there. And short of regulatory frameworks, we will have a problem because it will rob us of our authenticity, rob us of meritocracy. If, if you are able through economic means to enhance your, yours and your offspring's IQ, which theoretically should be, how am I gonna compete with you in a meritocratic society? So that's a serious uh, problem for our future as a humanity. I'll stop here in the interest of time. Well, if I may uh, react to... to uh, yes. Uh, to this because um, we've been talking, of course, more uh, precisely about uh, where you delve 
in the transhumanism question, but if we return, for instance, to the, the power question, uh, another point uh, you make in particular in uh, respects to the holders of power and to the holders of absolute or unchecked uh, power, so authoritarian uh, regimes. I and mean, of course you make the very valid point that because of the primacy of this, uh, this P5, this hold on power in an absolute unchecked way by authoritarians is, uh, is also somewhat irreversible. But um, you also make the point that you know, the, the way to get past that is to find ways indeed to safeguard human dignity. But again, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a little bit stuck uh, in the quandary there because uh, as much as some of us may want to further this human dignity to allow us to cope with our, our, our situations, how are we ever going to use this human dignity to check the absolute power of, uh, of the uh, holders? I mean, a very good example. Yesterday, there was a military coup in Burkina Faso. There's now a military officer in charge of the country. We can probably imagine in you know, your specter of things, uh, this man is already going about uh, feeling the absolute drive, a neurochemical drive to maximize uh, his power. How do we help the Burkina and Bay people uh, in this respect? The solution, as I said, I mean, this is an innate human predilection. You and I have it. It's not just this uh, military guy or, or this guy. Or, every human being has it. In fact, I, in fact, I said in my earlier remarks, every biological entity has it up to a certain level of consciousness and, and, and kind of, uh, um, kind of uh, acuity in terms of manipulating uh, circumstances to achieve that. So the issue is not to challenge what we could do. The only way forward is institution, accountable, transparent institutions, both domestically and internationally. That's the only way forward. Um, given the fact, as I said earlier, that the, there's a possibility that we may, I, in fact, we're not likely ever to do anything to limit these P5, this near P5, which was what you're hinting at maybe to keep us un, under check. That will never happen. I think the hint will be to even accentuate it, which will be even worse. Um, so the only way forward, actually, in, in any kind of society, in any kind of corporate structure, I mean, we always talk about politics, but uh, as, you, as I said earlier, the, the work here applies to any kind of structure. In a corporate entity, if you have a, a really aggressive CEO or, or, or has his own, you know, the board, uh, if, the institution, if the institution of the corporate entity is done in a way um, correctly, it will prevent excesses of human nature, as I call it in, in, the, in the earlier book. Human nature is there to stay. We will play with it, unfortunately, neurobiologically. But the only way to keep it in check until then, or and especially then, is really through accountable, transparent institutions. No other way. Now, we may fail, we may succeed, uh, but that's the only shot we have at it. Thomas. Yeah, perhaps uh, two uh, considerations in response to the question that uh, came up in the chat. Uh, and, and, and that is, you know, the challenge, how do we bring uh, insights of applied research uh, to policymakers. Huh? Right. That is a very fundamental challenge. Uh, and uh, two, two ideas you know, that come to my mind uh, um, right now, here at the GCSB, we are in the process of establishing a unit that focuses on policy analysis and advice. And this unit has as a an objective to offer policy advice to uh, uh, decision makers, be they Swiss, be they international. And I do hope, you know, that this uh, unit will also help, you know, uh, bring uh, these extremely rich insights, you know, that you have uh, produced in here, make sure that uh, at least some of them uh, get the attention yeah. of, of policy makers. Now, the, the question uh, uh, discussing uh, then policy implications of um, uh, 
new technologies, emerging mm -hmm. technologies, uh, uh, human augmentation, for instance. Well, what here comes to my mind is uh, this initiative uh, that is called GESTA, the Geneva mm -hmm. uh, Science and Diplomacy uh, Accelerator, that has as an ambition to provide a platform on the one hand to bring uh, on a radar, you know, potential uh, uh, science breakthroughs in, in the years to come, uh, but then also sensitize uh, policymakers for uh, the governance issues that come with these issues. And here again, I think uh, the, the lots of elements that I find in your two books that I think could contribute, could enrich, uh, could shape uh, uh, that discussion about the future, you know, need for recommendation, uh, regulation, um, um, shaping uh, the governance on, on, on these issues. So, you know, I, I think we have to find uh, practical uh, bridges <laughs> from the insights generated here to uh, policy making. And, and I think these are two that I would, you know, that come to my mind uh, very practically right now. Absolutely. And of course, probably the question of good governance and the functioning institutions is also key for our activities here in our courses, where basically a lot of focus is right. on these right. functioning institutions and good, good governance, especially in countries in political transition. Nicholas. Yes. To me, the, the, the challenges we are facing in these 21st centuries cannot be solved by just one stakeholder. It will not be just about states. Uh, regional governance, cities, but also increasingly civil society and businesses will enter this, this playground of governance, if I can call it that way. And I think we need fundamentally uh, to harness that plurality of forces in a positive way. That, that is the way forward, in my opinion. Uh, around technology, technology very clearly can be both a tool and it can be a weapon. Uh, and here the challenge to me really is how do we use technology to help us driving these efforts to find solutions rather than having this technology be used for either private profit or destruction. Mm. And, and this to me uh, has different implications. The first is obviously in terms of, government, of governance. Political time and regulatory time, if I can call it that way, and I've been for quite a few years, I've been sitting at the table at the World Trade Organization <laughs> Uh, either leading processes or negotiating on behalf of Switzerland on, on regulatory aspects of international trade. Regulatory time is slow. Political time tends to be relatively slow as well. Technology, and you make that point brilliantly, uh, Nayef, moves very, very fast. Mm. And so there is this extraordinary gap mm. in between the two. And it seems to me the way we look into how we do that regulatory work, how we process around this needs, needs to change as well. And perhaps technology can here as well help. It can be a tool to help us moving forward. Uh, but it, it, it remains to be seen how we harness these forces. Uh, very clearly, one of my concerns around technology is also the fact that we are living increasingly in what I would call digital feudalism system, mm -hmm. where a few actors essentially have enormous power because they can harness those technological forces. And therefore, technology doesn't necessarily serve the greater humanity. And here, it seems to me, building on your work, but also the work done by Nobel Prize winner Elinor Ostrom, who, who, who eloquently researched and spoke about the importance of commons, we probably need to think about how we use digital commons in the 21st century. How can we harness the digital commons 
and put them into this game to, to make sure technology remains a tool more uh, than a, a weapon. I think that's what I wanted to add. Uh, regarding the, the, the way to get younger people, tomorrow's leaders, uh, tomorrow's citizens, and I, I, I love this, this, this point you made, uh, Nayef, regarding the fact that knowing about uh, our human nature, or precisely essentially is a recipe for a more enlightened life, it's not just about governance, it's about us together, but also us as individuals. And, and we need to reach out, not just to those in power and in responsibility now, we also need to reach out to those who will be in these positions tomorrow. And I think in this context, we will need to obviously tweak the format a bit. Right. We'll have to make it very digestible to come back to Sir Francis and very chewable uh, in a, a, perhaps with, with a bit of humor, with, with, with you know, ways to, to sort of diffuse this in a, in, a, in a different way. But I think there is a tremendous potential here to reach out, not, not just to those who are in charge now, but to tomorrow's uh, people in charge, to, 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 the next, to the next generations. Correct. And, and what you mentioned, uh, uh, which reiterated what I said, even, even somebody who will never get into policy or never corporate uh, hierarchy, they'll be better people. They'll, they'll, they'll be more gratified, more successful, more, more useful to their societies if they're aware of their limitations and the danger zone. Um, that are, will be beyond their, 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 their perceived control at some point. Thank you. The, the time runs very fast. We have only three minutes left until the end of our session. That's why, if, if you don't mind, I would like... We, we have answered a lot of questions already, basically, that we have in the chat during our discussion. But maybe a last uh, question uh, to you, Nayef, mm -hmm. uh, uh, slightly... A different subject, but of course linked to what we have discussed. Uh, we are currently witnessing resurgence of political and military tensions mm -hmm. between Russia and the West. We have seen a lot of and been, been following all the discussions here in Geneva and other European capitals. Could you? Uh, we see a lot of confrontation there. Uh, how can an understanding of emotional and moral egoism and neurochemistry of power inform? this ongoing diplomatic talks and negotiations, and which motivation can we provide for cooperation in this specific context of European security? Mm. An so, easy one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one <laughs> minute. <Yes. laughs> no pressure. No pressure, exactly. <laughs> Thank you, Sasha. That's a very, very important uh, point, and it's very topical. Uh, and it goes back to the knowing, and you remember I mentioned emotional aim or egoism at the individual level, but then I've also theorized that emotional aim or egoism at the state level. So states are emotional. And states, in the context of power, will overreach. No state in human history, unchecked, never mind individuals, no, remains unchecked, will not venture into hegemonous enterprises. That's just the way life works. And it's very unfortunate. And why it makes it, um, this is, has been the behavior of human beings in organized entities, whether it's theological or in state form, since the state became an issue, throughout human history. Why is it counterproductive today? Uh, if, you, if, if somebody is listening, uh, that in our connected, uh, world, instantly connected and deeply interdependent world, which I've said a hundred times, no one will win if everybody else doesn't win. The idea of zero-sum paradigms um, does not work. And if it works, it creates a multitude of new problems. We need to think of multi-sum security, which I've defined that multi-sum security is that no state will be secure if every other state is not secure. So we need, we need dialogue, which GCSP is so brilliant at. We need to talk to, to our adversaries. And 
and even in the current conflict, to me, uh, uh, it's obvious what the issue is. And it's probably obvious to all sides. Um, and it's easily resolvable on, on rational grounds. But, but the problem is when you get, uh, that's what I don't like about when there's a conflict, including human to human, individual to individual, when you announce your intentions or Tarzan moment, it, it, then you lock yourself in. You cannot, you, you, you can't un, you go back. And I think this is not helping, you know, feeding the media certain things uh, here and there. You've locked yourself in, but maybe you, maybe that's your intention is to make it to, to that you don't, there's no going back. But the world is too small, it's too connected, it's too interdependent. The way forward through symbiotic realism, it's a realist world, uh, it's not, let's not be playful, it's not, uh, there's no idealism because of human nature that we talked about. So it, it needs to be symbiotic, it needs to be win-win, it needs to be what I call absolute gains rather than relative gains. Um, and it needs to allow non-conflictual competition. These are the tenets of symbiotic realism. Uh, not, you can compete, but uh, you don't. But there must be a mechanism to make it non-conflictual. And if you draw up on history, which is what strategic culture uh, I mentioned briefly, but we don't have time. If you if you draw on history, or heroisms, or past injuries, or past memories, you'll you'll never get anywhere. It's almost like a relationship between two individuals. If you remember every word that was said inappropriately, you're not going to go more forward. We need to be mature about problems. Of course, there are problems. Some of them historical, some of them are current. But the problem is, I think it has to do with hegemony of the state, the emotionality of the state. The, um, the state locking itself down knowingly or unknowingly through the mass media. And if you backtrack, you're weak or you're, you've been, you've been um, overwhelmed, all of which I think are immature, counterproductive, and will get you nowhere. It's very cost, conflict is extremely expensive, um, no matter how capable you are. And I, I, think, I think it's basic common sense. Look at the problem, find a compromise. I remember my first year of university, one of my professors, um, he said one of the, the central questions of life is compromise. No one is going to get everything they want in life. And if it, it is the smart, it's not weak to compromise. It's actually smart. You're saving energy, you're saving uh, antagonisms. So it's compromise. Find a solution. Now, compromise is obvious to everyone, by the way, in every human conflict. But some people think they can get away without compromise. And that's why it gets worse. Thank you very much. Thank you, Naif. Um, I think we have all uh, extremely, extremely benefited uh, from, uh, from this discussion. My main conclusion that the topics that you discuss in your books, they are relevant for the past, for the present, and will be very relevant in the future. So once again, I would invite our audience to read those books uh, and enjoy this reading. I will now thank you all, the author and our speakers, uh, for their insights, for the very interesting discussion. Please, the audience also uh, join me in this round of applause. <laughs> I'm also grateful to you, the audience, for uh, joining us virtually and for asking your question. Please stay tuned. We will have more GCSP events to come uh, virtually and hopefully soon uh, in a face-to-face -face format. And we're wishing you a very nice day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.